Good afternoon, a warm welcome and thanks for tuning in. My name is Miki Okoyama and I'm happy to be your host for our new online event series U-Talk at Unternehmertum. As convening face-to-face -face is currently quite a challenge, we decided to start a new online series and bring interesting and intriguing insights about different topics around entrepreneurship and innovation right to your home. Due to the current situation, this uh, talk is pre-recorded, um, but we will be live with you later for Q&A. On the right side of your screen, you can post your questions and we'll answer as much as we can later on. Today, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Philip Gabbard, director at our initiative Applied AI and also future shaper of Unternehmertum. We'll discuss the implications of the current corona crisis on artificial intelligence. Philip is a quantum physicist by training and um, has spent 15 years as a senior partner at the Boston Consulting Group. During the last five years, he was also senior or global leader, sorry, of digital strategy and artificial intelligence in business. So Philip, to start the talk, um, can you tell us a little bit more what the initiative Applied AI is doing? Sure. At Applied AI, we're a group at Unternehmertum that has the mission to help lift Germany into the AI age. And we want to do that by increasing really the application of artificial intelligence in business. Okay. Our core methodology is we have a huge partner network and we classify companies into maturity levels from experimenting with AI all the way to really shaping the uh, industry with AI and we try to help them to increase in this uh, maturity level with you know strategy and operations, with engineering, round tables and exchange and also education. Okay, thank you. So let's pick up directly this the title of this session, um, Corona at an inflection point. So do you think we are at an inflection point for artificial intelligence? And if yes, why so? Well, the crisis was very interesting and we think it could trigger an inflection point for, applied, for AI. Uh, the reason is we all experienced, you know, when we were shut down home, how we suddenly started using digital. And uh, everyone, you know, is now much better than he was before in video, in using storyboards, and uh, uh, probably even upgraded his uh, um, Wi-Fi access, etc. And we know what the difficulties are, where we can improve, and everyone think, what do we do afterwards? How can we leverage all the things we've been doing so far? Mm -hmm. Now, interesting, the, the same thing is happening with artificial intelligence, but it's not happening here in Europe. It's primarily happening in China, where you see a huge scale deployment of artificial intelligence in combating the corona crisis and in you know, dealing with all its effects. And some of the leading companies are watching that. And we saw actually articles in all the worldwide press from the Economist to Technology Review, South China Morning Post and so on, of what's happening there and how this is changing the use of AI and what that will mean for the post-corona world. OK. Can you give a few examples? Sure. Let's start with the obvious one, healthcare, right? Um, so, if you recall, SARS in 2002 mm -hmm. took about five months to, from you know, identifying the disease to actually uh, isolating the virus. Okay. In Corona, the virus was uh, isolated by the group of uh, Jiang Yangzhen uh, on the 5th of January, um, heavily using What do you mean by isolated? He identified the virus okay. uh, and, and the sequence of the virus. Okay. And on January 11th, he published it globally, mm -hmm. one day before China even announced there was a disease. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, you know, Baidu had its linear fold algorithm that uh, analyzed the secondary sequ RNA sequence of the virus within 27 seconds. You know, these are things that happened, so to say, immediately at that point. Obviously, uh, beyond that, you had then lots of applications in actually managing the disease. You had, um, first of all, you had a, a Baidu again. Baidu is at the forefront of this because it was designated by China to lead the AI part. So you had uh, CT scan lesions, uh, CT scans AI algorithm that identified lesions. So no, you know, to, in order to mm -hmm. uh, check for the virus. You had a, a um, huge um, deployment on Beijing train stations with um, AI-based um, infrared detectors to detect whether multi-people, uh, in a multi-people environment, so lots of people, 
do they have fever or not? Okay. You had uh, cameras that detected are people re uh, um, ap applying the oral nasal masks and so on to so identify in a large crowd. And but that's more technologies that are not AI yet, right? Like, oh no, 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 it's definitely face recognition. It's it's a face recognition. Oh, okay. It's it's a, 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 if all of face recognition is AI based. You have no no chance to recognize faces without because AI. Because detecting the temperature is. Was the first step, but yes, the second was was infrared. Okay. But then to actually identify in a large crowd, you know, do these people have fever? Does one of them have fever? And if so, which person? Okay. Is a very hard, you know, recognition part. Mm. And so it's all these uh, things that were, so to say, completely novel, and that helped a lot. Also, you know, you also had, you know, identifying, you know. Um, travel of people outside of Wuhan, you know, navigation data, so to say, to, to see who travels, etc. So it was very widely used in fighting the disease from the first day. But why do you think does that mark an inflection point in China? Oh, because people see how powerful it is and they couldn't have dealt without this. Okay. They also see okay. what works and what doesn't work, mm -hmm. right? So you, you see, you know, the weakness that it has and the things where it already works very well. What about other applications besides healthcare? Well, the second thing you had is you realized humans were A, shut down, mm -hmm. and B, they couldn't deal with the scale. And you suddenly started using AI to deal with the huge scales and to go where humans couldn't go. Mm -hmm. First example was still on the healthcare. Um, the, uh, China has actually several healthcare telemedicine platforms. A good doctor by Ping An is one of the largest. It managed 1.1 billion calls within the peak during the peak of the uh, uh, infection, and the regulator actually released uh, it to be able to do primary uh, diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Originally, it's, it was forbidden uh, in telemedicine to do primary diagnosis. You couldn't do secondary and, and repeat diagnosis, but not primary. But you couldn't otherwise deal with that volume. You had robocalls, you know, that called 1,500 people per second, you know, to essentially track, you know, what contacts that they have, where are they going, and an and arbitrary thing. So you had, you had autonomous um, robots that went to wards um, to disinfect them or to bring people food and medicine, which was, you know, not possible in, in these areas. So all of these sort of deployments are because it was simply too dangerous for people to go or you couldn't deal with, mm -hmm. with the whole effect. Mm -hmm. However, that's not the only thing you had. So most of that was in China, but you had also very interesting developments in the US. Um, a, a widely discussed example is Facebook. So Facebook was interesting because it was one of the first companies to shut down, uh, not to shut down, to send people home, okay. to shut down. It did not want to shut down, quite in the country. So it sent home its 45,000 employees End of February already, mm -hmm. home. Almost. It actually also had 15,000 contractors. Mm -hmm. And what the contractors were supposed to do is to check online content for inappropriate content. Okay. Now, funnily enough, they have to sit behind the firewall because the data are so sensitive and there's a huge privacy issues that Facebook doesn't want to get to other privacy content. So they said they have to remain behind the firewall. So it kept these employees for another three weeks until there was a huge outcry, you, you know, that they exposing the contractors to that risk. Mm -hmm. So they sent them home and the only thing they could do is now they monitor it by the, via AI. Okay. Uh, AI is not quite ready for that. So you will see mistakes, you know, some things that aren't inappropriate and are classified and so on. But it's the largest scale uh, um, experiment you ever had. And similar to what we are doing with digital, they really gain lots of experience, you know, how to improve it, how to do it via AI to reach that scale and do it when people can no longer do it. So this must have also meant a huge cost saving for Facebook and potentially for many other applications as well. Well, right now, as you might know, they are extremely generous. They pay all their employees. They didn't, uh, contrary to lots of other Silicon Valley companies, uh, uh, they didn't send anybody home. They gave guarantees to everybody. So they have, all these contracts are fully paid. So no, it's all extra cost at the moment because uh, you know, everybody is fully paid other than uh, potential travel costs. Right? Mm. So you said earlier, Europe is not there yet, while AI really, or Corona really marked an inflection point in China. What do you think needs to happen in Europe, or, or why so? Well, you can answer it several respects. I mean, one is, let's say, regulation and government, mm -hmm. um, healthcare in particular. Um, 
in Europe, we're somewhat stuck at the level of discussing guidelines. Mm -hmm. And guidelines are very important. Um, but clearly, if you think, you know, I think you have two problems with being stuck in the guideline discussion. One is if you become an AI colony, if you com completely fall behind in technology, you have no say whatsoever how it develops. Mm -hmm. You know, a colony has no rights. <laughs> if you want. The other one is that you, you know, we used to discuss it, you know, just, you know, are we falling behind economically, but now you see that we actually, we, we can't deal with crisis in the way others did. All, all these technologies would have helped in Italy, would have helped in the UK, would have helped in Spain. And I think you have to find the right balance to, yes, discuss these things, but also to encourage people to innovate, to to help startups, to provide data to startups. I mean, we at Apply, I have a very intense uh, 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 dialogue with the European Union to say, how can you help startups and companies in that respect? The other part, if I may say, is for companies, mm -hmm. right? Companies, even if you didn't experience yourself, you must see what's happening in China. I mean, clearly the Americans are. <laughs> they immediately said, look, next time we have to be better prepared technologically. And I think for the, for the companies, you should watch and say exactly, you know, this experience, particularly for scaling AI. Um, scaling AI is very hard because data write code, so it's, 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 you can't separate it from software. To say, you know, what can we learn for externally from, you know, how to scale it. And post-corona, we know we cannot continue as we were before. Mm -hmm. we, everyone knows for the digital part, you should also realize it for the AI part and now redouble your investment there. Mm. But policy making in, in the EU works in a fundamentally different way than in the US, right? Probably also because we're much more cautious about the risks and also the ethical or <coughs> moral issues that come with it. What do you advise or what would you advise governments or policy makers to still not like lose the competition with China or the US in that in that race to apply AI in different in different industries or sectors? Obviously, you need to manage the risks, and we can come to some immediate, uh, actually, a very interesting uh, experience you got with risk and AI in this crisis. But one doesn't exclude the other. You can, you know, you can still encourage people to apply it, to get it into the German Mittelstand, to you know, to 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 leverage people in particular, also provide secure access to data for startups, for example. Yes. So yes, you keep the privacy, but then you provide secure access and so on. So there are lots of ways to encourage companies and to help multipliers in order to drive that and not lose the competitive game here. But, and how would you um, kind of work with the concerns or the, the doubts that companies also have, whether an algorithm really works for them or whether it's... Um, it doesn't bring them into ethical conflicts or, yeah, things like Well, that. ethical conflicts are reasonably well managed. I mean, they're easily manageable. I mean, you know the core. I mean, obviously, you have to avoid bias and so on and so forth. I think the other part well, is how well... I think that's an important point, actually, bias. Because how do you train an algorithm that really has no bias? Is that really possible? There's also a big discussion around AI, right? You train an algorithm from data. All data are finite and thus have some kind of bias. Um, we actually, in terms of the normal bias, is if you know what you want, is rather easy to correct. Mm -hmm. In diversity, if you want the median to be the same, you can force the median to be the same. In AI, you measure all the results, mm -hmm. so you know precisely how it performs. And you can influence all the results. You can just rewrite the algorithm. You can't rewrite millions of people. You can rewrite the algorithm. So will you know whatever measure of ethics or fairness you agree on, you can force the algorithm to have. That's so to say the comparatively easy part. The other risks of AI are harder to deal with, and that is something where we get again a mega experiment right now. So one of the biggest risks in AI is it doesn't have any common sense. So it has a very hard time to deal with situations that never, it has never seen before. Now, you can hardly imagine any more extreme situation than what we have seen. No one has seen the world economy being affected by the virus at the same time globally and shutting down. Right? It's what you know, some people call a black swan event. It's something you haven't seen in your data before. 
Um, and it's actually quite interesting. We don't know yet how well algorithms performed. Uh, the most interesting part is probably financial markets because mm -hmm. financial markets use AI very heavily because they need to because they have to react so quickly. Mm -hmm. And we see dramatic differences in performances in financial markets, but obviously no one quite discloses at that point in time you know, whether the algorithms worked or not. But it's, you know, Corona is one of the biggest, so say, black swan tests of AI. Mm -hmm. Now, again, people just have to know how to deal with those risks, and you can deal with those risks. I mean, there, there are several ways to deal it. We at Apply AI often help companies to have a human in the loop, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and to, but you have to plan that beforehand. The other one is we know how to build algorithms to make them resilient. Mm -hmm. uh, one standard methodology is actually you build an adversarial algorithm who tries to find the weaknesses. So you buy, find an algorithm that essentially tries to test whether you are really good enough or not. And that's one of the most effective ways to really build very resilient AI, but you have to do it. So we see lots of deployments with companies that are less experienced, that, that are not aware of you know, the potential risks. They are still stuck in, you know, yeah. how do I, how, how do I how to deal with diversity is comparatively easy. But these risks are hard, and we work with our partners very hard to you know, make them aware of these risks and to build proper. Well, would you yeah. advise companies who are less experienced with AI how to uh, build their experience? Like, more internally with projects, with consultants, to work together with startups, what's the best way to, to, um, yeah, to gain experience? Well, frankly, the first you should do, what we offer actually, is to do an assessment of your AI maturity. Because mm -hmm. what you do and how risky it is depends a little bit on where you stand right now. Mm -hmm. So you cannot do a large-scale deployment if you haven't yet managed the pipeline or if your data are still not clean, etc., etc. And then I think you can do all of the above, but in artificial intelligence, you, artificial intelligence is not plug and play, so you cannot outsource it. You can't out, just buy it in a sense, because lots of these algorithms, they have to work with your data. Mm -hmm. So you have to train them on your data. So somehow they're very internal and they can be very business critical. So you have to, you, you know, and, and you don't quite know the results. It's always probabilistic. So you, you, you have to, you know, manage. It's always a probabilistic result um, to know how to deal with that and how to manage it over time. So there is no way around to build a strong understanding of AI and then take a real, you know, then you can go to use cases, experiments, scaling up, uh, etc. all around that. Okay. There, actually, there are actually other parts, I mean, perhaps just to say, you know, what is the real advanced uh, AI? So the US last year launched a DARPA challenge. You might know DARPA Challenge is the agency that brought us the internet, that okay. had huge challenges about self-driving cars that everyone knows and so on. So they launched an interesting DARPA Challenge. Uh, it's called Sail On. Um, it's science uh, and AI learning um, on, so to say, uh, in, on uh, novel environments, open world novel environments. Um, and the question is, how do you make AI perform in chaotic environments, mm -hmm. highly dynamic and chaotic environments? And that's a really tough challenge. I mean, there's a military aspect, but most of it is actually very useful in the real world. And I think we should pick that up. In Germany, we just launched the Institute for Sprung Innovation, and they should have such challenges where we go to the really, really hard problems if you want to deploy it for chaotic environments, for very dynamic environments, where it might be critical because it can react so quickly. Okay. AI is more than a million times faster than you know, mm -hmm. your thoughts. So it can react very quickly but you have to be very sure it reacts correctly, right? So these are the real hard things to do, um, which companies cannot do today, obviously, but where we should, you know, launch our own research in how to deploy that. So earlier you said that AI doesn't have a common sense. Do you think one day it can have a common sense? It could. Look, um, this could be a long discussion, but the brief answer is, what is common sense? Common sense is if you take an experience from a completely different realm because it's obvious. You sit at your computer doing financial markets and the fire breaks out. You run out of the room. That's common sense. 
and say, I will not do that. Why not? Because it, you trained it on financial market data. You didn't train it on the real world. So the, the reason it doesn't have common sense is because it's trained in a very narrow domain. And you want to train it on a narrow domain because you want to do it precisely what you, you, know, you, want, you want to control. It. Within that narrow domain, it can have creativity, mm -hmm. strategy, you saw it in chess again, in Momo, extremely creative, but in a very narrow environment. Okay. So as long as you don't train AI in the entire world, it cannot have grinds. And in fact, you don't want to train in the entire world because you want to make sure that you control it. So I think that's something that's not, that you can't overcome, but you can overcome, so to say, to say, okay, how to react if something unexpected happens how do you shut down safely? How can you, you know, mm. do something so nothing happens? <laughs> so coming to our last question, maybe it was a quick summary. Um, so what would you advise governments, like maybe one, two, three things, how to advance AI quicker in Europe? I think it's a message to governments and companies. Okay. I mean, for governments, it's very clear you need to go and really push business innovation via AI, not just incremental innovation. That's where the fight is being you know, fought for the global competition and to get it in threats. And I think the best thing to do is really to A, foster really programs to increase the maturity on the one hand, and on the other hand, give innovative ideas and startups a real chance in particular data be a first customer for them, you know, give them, give them the opportunity to, to grow in Europe. For companies, I think the most important thing is to realize right now, that's why we, we wrote the article too, in some parts of the world, if you watch closely, the experience companies have with AI is similar to the experience you're having with digital. They see the power, they see what large-scale deployment can do, they see how it can build competitive advantage, and we know in the post-corona world, we will you know, have completely different fights for competitive advantage. We have lots of industries that will need to change the way they work right now and to really embrace AI and to learn from the experiences elsewhere and invest heavily and not you know, stop investing because you think you know, there are so many other things, but say, you know, this is one of the core tools you have to really make a leap forward. Thank you very much. It was a privilege meeting. Yeah. So we will answer your questions now, but from a different setting, out of our home office. Um, to those uh, ones who are not going to stay with us, thank you very much to you all for tuning in. We will see you next week, May 26, same time, same platform. And you'll hear about the project Tech 216, for which Unternehmertum joined forces with the German Corporation for International Cooperation to shape a platform aiming to connect German and Tunisian companies, creating new IT business and achieving a win-win situation with our pilot partner, BMW. The project is supported by the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. So stay safe, see you soon, and thanks again very much, Philip Gabbard. Thank you very much. And I guess we're live now, right? Yes. Hello, Philip again, from home office, home office to home office. Yes, finally home again. <laughs> now here to, I can't hear Philip, unfortunately, so I have some technical problems. I'm not sure why. But okay. um, I'll just start with the first question. Ah, all right. um, we got a few questions from the audience. Um, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. It's great to see that there's so many people actually um, dialed in or uh, follow the invitation. So the first question from the audience was, how can you actually measure a country's AI maturity and which European countries are at the forefront of applying AI? Okay, a country's AI maturity is less trivial to, me to, lever uh, to measure, excuse me, than a, um, excuse me, a country than a company. So for a country, there are typically uh, several levels. You can obviously say um, in terms of research, what is the level of publications, what is the level of IP, what is the level of uh, investments, uh, and where do their um, government or companies 
sit within AI, what influence they have in the global economy. So that would be kind of standard competitiveness measures applied to AI. For a specific company, you can be much more specific. You can kind of say, you know, what are the elements that you need to deal with AI in terms of product strategy, in kind of uh, how many use cases you have, what they acquire, and how what you do in terms of data, IT infrastructure, governance, people, talent, ecosystem. And there you can measure the maturity in a very precise level, which, you know, even economists would have a hard time to do on a country level. I can't say whether it answered your question. I hope it did. <laughs> I think Philip Signal gets to meet, I think, 15 seconds later or so. OK, yeah. I can do this when uh, I Yeah, let's question. go with the second <laughs> question that we got from the audience. Um, so how can we foster more international cooperation in the field of AI? Look. Um, Currently, there is actually quite a bit of cooperation. Um, we still are at a level of AI where most of the leading algorithms are open source and public, um, which is quite amazing. There is very few institutes uh, that have gone dark. You expected them to go dark, but nobody you know, has gone dark so far. Um, I compare that to quantum computing, which is another hobby of mine, where you actually have export restrictions, et cetera, et cetera. You have nothing of that in AI. Um, so I think in terms of cooperation between countries, between the community, what there is, uh, there's quite a bit. What you have is very different environments for companies to develop within the regions. So China invests very heavily and opens up the huge data pools. The US has uh, some very big tech players. And Europe has, on the one hand, is very restrictive on the applications. On the other hand, has smaller markets and the standard technologies. So the reason for it not to develop is not a lack of cooperation. It's really a lack of, so to say, individual environment among the regions. Um, data are obviously not shared. Um, data sharing is on the retreat. Um, China, in China, all sensitive data have to be in China. Um, Europe is pretty much developing the same direction. Uh, and the US is rather mixed, but since they have the large giants, they don't have the problem in a certain sense. Um, so I think and since data is critical for developing AI, um, access to data is particularly difficult in Europe. So that's why it's enormously important to cooperate on data. The European community is trying to put out data pools um, that are safe and, and secured and federated and, and all the things. So I think that's a very important part um, for, for cooperation. On the algorithmic side, the cooperation is so far extremely good. Sorry, I'm done. <laughs> so then we have a third question, um, interesting one. What is the role of humans when we delegate tasks to AI? So we'll assume, so we are. Okay, I think there are there are several different levels. Um, the first level is actually you build the AI, um, so you're responsible for everything the AI does, right? Uh, including, including very importantly, not only performance, but ethical compliance and very critical interpretability, right? So you understand what the AI is doing. The second part is obviously you have to oversee the AI. Um, that actually has to be prepared when you. Uh, build the AI because AI might act very fast. So if you want to be on a, um, for example, in financial markets, in order for you to be able to interfere, you have to prepare it, what you say, preparing human in the loop. So uh, humans can be, so to say, effective. And then obviously um, they need to, you know, make sure it develops, they need to maintain it, and they need to be um, ready to step in uh, if, if there's any problem and you had, you know, something stepping out of AI. So now I at least lost, yeah, here you are again. Here, we're back. <laughs> mm, okay. And um, so maybe last question. So as we're seeing companies okay, putting budgets on freeze right now, how should the development of AI be pursued, especially now? 
Okay, let me, can, can I just add one to the last point because I don't know what the intent of the question is. The other question is what, if AI takes over a task that the human had done before, what should she do? I mean, we, AI will actually trigger large reskilling. We know that, we had that before in other parts. Most people, we did actually several questionnaires um, where we asked people, do you fear that AI takes over your uh, parts of your tasks? Uh, and about 20 to 25% said yes, the others not. And then we asked them, do you hope AI takes over some of your paths? And I think 70% said yes, right? So, <laughs> you know, it's not all bad if AI, so to say, takes over, uh, so to say, some of your tasks. So just so you say, what you do, yes, you have to reskill, you can focus on other things, but uh, in, in uh, you know, lots of cases, that's a good thing. Okay, so let's come back to your question. I think it was, what should companies do, right? Correct? Um, look, now that you are um, that you are at the at, in the yes. midst of a crisis, you have obviously um, lots of trade-offs where you focus your investments. I think the most important thing is to realize that the post-corona, well, you will not save your way out of corona. Uh, and the same way, as I said in the beginning, you learned about digital and um, companies should learn about AI and said, look, this is really critical in order to be more effective, um, to be a better company after the crisis uh, and to you know, to really participate. Um, I sometimes compare it to watching planes in the First World War. Um, they were used only for surveillance, but everybody could see their potential. And every single country in the world invested heavily in, in planes after the war because they understood what the potential is. And I think the same should be true of AI. Yes, the situation is difficult sort of in Corona, but you know you need to kind of um, now fight for your competitiveness because market shares are typically decided, you know, huge shifts of market shares always happen during crisis. So you have to be extremely sensitive to invest in these areas. And in particular, I say in Europe, because the Chinese and partially the US were directly exposed to the effects of AI. So they saw it immediately to say, what, how powerful it can be and are much more incentivized to go for it here. If you ask around and say, what was the experience during the crisis? Everyone talks about digital. No one realized that AI had something to do with it. So I think that's, that's our core point to say, no, realize how powerful it is. You missed some of the experience, but you can learn from others. International cooperation is still very good. Invest heavily afterwards. It will be critical for the competitive. <clears throat> okay. Well, I think we're unfortunately out of time. Um, we have a lot more questions. Unfortunately, we cannot answer. Um, but thank you very much to the audience for all the questions and for the big interest in our first session for uh, of the U Talk. Um, Please also sign up for our monthly newsletter so you will always be kept up to date on our next sessions and next topics. Next week, we will have um, a panel discussion on the Tech 216 project um, where Amel Zaidan of the Tunisian Startup Association will moderate um, the panel. And I think for that, um, Philip Gerrard, thank you very much for joining the session. And, thank you very um, much. Any I more hope to see you all next app? week. Feel Thank you. free to contact me via LinkedIn, you know, and just ask your questions. Thank you.